You know, I believe in grand entrances. And I think what I've got in store here today certainly fits the bill. When I was first seriously considering going through with this channel, I asked myself, what aircraft would I start with? It would have to be something legendary, something that has stood the test of time. But it also couldn't be something that everybody already knows. What could be legendary, but also underrated? I think you'll agree with what I chose here today. Roll the intro, Jimbo. Yeah, today I'm talking about the P-40 Kitty Hawk. And I'm also talking about the P-40 Tomahawk. And we're also going to be talking about the P-40 Warhawk. But I'm still talking about the same platform here. See, the P-40 got all those names because this was a bird that was used all over the world. Speaking of traveling the world, before I really get into the history of the P-40, I want to give a colossal thank you to the Air Classics Museum. They are being immeasurably generous to me by letting me film hands-on with their P-40 replica here. So if you like aviation history, visit Air Classics in Sugar Grove, show them some love. All right, now back to history. The P-40 was an aircraft that was worth more than the sum of its parts. And the first place you could see that fact was in how many people use the vehicle. See, this was more than just some American aircraft that was sometimes sent to other nations. Almost every Allied power in World War II used the P-40, and no matter where it went, it was putting in real work. So if it was so popular, then why did I call it underrated earlier? Well, we'll get into that, be patient. But this wasn't an aircraft exactly known for ending the war, but she was there when it kicked off. It's early World War II. For years, air forces around the world were being crushed by Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and even the seldom talked about fascist Italian Air Force was getting its fair share of aces. The start of the war was less a conflict and more of a systematic annihilation of surrounding regions by the Axis powers. In 1940, the ones on the receiving ends of the attack started blocking the punches. And one year later, well, I'm not saying the P-40 turned the tide of the war, but I am saying its combat performance certainly sent a message. P-40s first saw combat in North Africa with British aviators. At this point in the war, the biggest threat to the P-40 was the fact that the Axis powers had plenty of time and experience to refine their own aircraft designs. Now, with 2020 hindsight, the modern view of the P-40 is not very glamorous. It's criticized for being underpowered, both in the engine and weaponry departments. But truth be told, it was actually one of the best fighters one could ask for at the time. At ideal altitudes, it could turn on a dime, easily going toe-to-toe -to -toe with anything the Luftwaffe could put forward. In the Pacific, Sure, it could be outturned by the legendarily lightweight Oscars and Zeros, but those aircraft actually had issues with their build design, where performing those tight turns could damage the structural integrity of the aircraft. The P-40 would happily bear the load of the G-forces. In fact, the structural strength of the aircraft was so good, there have been accounts of P-40s using intentional ramming attacks to score kills and survive the process. Quick story there. Soviet ace pilot Captain Alexei Klobistov is the only pilot in history credited with scoring two ram kills in a single flight, and he did so using a P-40. He bashed his right wing against an ME-110, then used the same wing against an ME-109, and he landed the P-40 back at base. He would score three ramming kills total in his experience, earn the award Hero of the Soviet Union, among others, and his death in 1943 was reportedly either a mid-air collision or him ramming in his damaged airplane into a ground target. What a legend. Hey bro, watch your jet. Watch your jet, bro. Watch your jet! Aside from maneuverability, its speed was average for early war, and its range was about double what the Spitfire could do. One big thing holding the P-40 back was its rate of climb and max altitude. Unfortunately for anyone below the P-40, what it lacked in climbing ability, it more than made up for in its ability to dive. It made for an excellent dive bomber, and its already strong turning ability was magnified here, as performing the same maneuvers at high speed really did nothing to hinder the performance, whereas other aircraft would strain under the additional force of the high speed turns. 
Probably the most respected aspect of the P40, however, was its ability to put in work no matter where it was. Seeing service everywhere from Stalingrad to the Solomons, from Alexandria to Alaska, it really only makes sense that the P40 got so many names. And by the way, I am kind of starting to second guess my choice of aircraft for this video, because saying P40 over and over and over for the sake of accuracy is starting to annoy me. But if I know if I just say Warhawk, some nerds are going to correct me in the comments. Here's what I mean by that. The manufacturer, Curtis, originally just called it the Hawk, but models that were sent for combat were called Tomahawks, and minor changes were even made to better ease international use. And we'll get back to that. But even the naming scheme was changed to fit the British Mark system, calling these aircraft Tomahawk Mark Ones, whereas in the States, we used ABC model designations. When the D model came around, the design was refined to break free of its pre-war roots, and was given the new name Kitty Hawk. Finally, the F model introduced the title of Warhawk, and all subsequent models used that name. And from then on, most of the upgrades were tweaks to the engine or cockpit equipment. Since we're on the topic of aircraft design, this is a good time to call in Jimbo to go over the statistics of what the Kitty Hawk could do. Good day, peasants! Today I'll talk about the E-Mod, because although the later Warhawk models were more produced, it was earlier variants that people more often think of. Plus, there really ain't that much of a difference. The P-40 was originally equipped with the V-12 Allison liquid-cooled engine, which put out about 1,240 horsepower, which gave it a top speed of about 290 knots. Some P-40s had Rolls-Royce Merlin engines installed, but these were rare since Merlin engines were highly sought after by basically everyone producing combat aircraft. The Allison engine had a really hard time at altitudes of about 15,000 feet, but it could potentially ascend to a service ceiling of 29,000 feet. Early Tomahawk variants were armed with 430 cal guns in the wings and 250 cal guns in the nose, but after the Kitty Hawk was rolled out, they almost always used the standard American fighter layout of 650 cals in the wings. Armed with 235 rounds per gun, that's basically 20 seconds worth of time pulling the trigger. It should also be noted that Tomahawks going to the British forces had the 30 cals replaced with the British 303 caliber guns, just one of the many things the US was doing with the lead and lease program to assist Britain's use of the hardware. The Kitty Hawk could also lift about 2,000 pounds worth of bombs across three hard points. A P-40 can fly about 620 nautical miles, double that if one of those hard points I mentioned earlier has a drop tank on it. When taxiing on the ground, P-40 pilots often needed ground crew members to sit on the wings and guide them along because the nose was so large that they could not see over it themselves. The P-40 also had a strong but modular design, making maintenance very easy, meaning pilots had an airframe that could handle intense maneuvers and ground crews are basically playing with Legos if something needed to be replaced. As a parting note, crews from every nation that operated the P-40 of all variants had no complaints about reliability. The aircraft might not have had the best performance ever, but hey, is ready to do any job, anytime, anywhere. That's all for me, but... Steve... has more to say. Appreciate it, Jimbo. And yeah, in regards to his last note, not only did ground crews find it very easy to work on P-40s, every major nation the P-40 was deployed to produced an ace. And it's now I wanted to tell you a story about one of those aces. But I just wasn't satisfied only sharing his story. So if you'd humor me, I'd like to tell two stories today. The first story I have really tells how this was a world touring aircraft. Clive R. Caldwell was the number one P-40 pilot in history, as well as Australia's top scoring pilot, period. He left Australia to fly American planes fighting with the British Royal Air Force against Germans and Italians in North Africa and it was in this theater where he would make a stunning performance. First of note, he was involved with the Tomahawk's first air kill. He was flying wingman and his leader shot down an Italian Z-1007 bomber. Well, sorta. The kill is unofficial, so it's open for debate, I guess. Interestingly, for a top ace, he started off having a hard time landing his angled shots on target, so he took a proactive approach and literally invented his own training technique. He practiced what he called shadow shooting, where he would attempt to land shots on an aircraft shadow. He would have a squadron mate fly over a nearby bay, low to the water, and then he would approach from a different angle and attempt to land shots on his wingman's shadow. This is pretty clever, because by chasing a shadow at different angles, you're training for different approaches. Since the shadow is moving, you have a realistic target. 
and your wingman can use water getting kicked up from the bullets to determine and visualize whether or not the shots hit the target. Not to mention that in order to hit your shadow, you'd have to be aimed at the ground, which is a maneuver the tomahawk excelled at, meaning you weren't just training to lead your target, you were training to lead your target in the exact scenario where you have the advantage on your opponent. This technique was so effective, the Royal Air Force adopted it as an official training method. Caldwell got his own first kill on his 30th sortie, a BF-109. Eight days later, he had the misfortune of watching a Nazi pilot shoot down a close friend, Donald Monroe, while he was on a parachute. For those who don't know, though it wasn't against the rules of war at the time to shoot down bailed out aviators, it's very, very taboo, especially with other aviators. It's considered a courtesy thing. The guy is dangling by a string in the wind. His wings are clipped. He's lost his guns. You've won the fight. Aviators tend to have respect for other aviators in that sense. Watching Monroe die in his parachute, that caused Caldwell to... Well... Well, he got more aggressive after that. His new attitude earned him the nickname Killer, which he disliked. He had picked up the practice of attacking bailed-out aviators, which he defended by saying it was not a matter of bloodlust, and he would only attack when the enemy pilots were landing where they could not be taken prisoner. He simply didn't want the enemy to be able to attack again. His nickname also stemmed from his habit to use up all his remaining ammunition on enemy troops and convoys after his primary missions were over. In his own words, it's your life or theirs. This is war. One unfortunate day over Egypt, Caldwell found himself in the crossfire of two 109s coming from each wing. To make things worse, one of the attackers happened to be a Nazi ace, and a famous one in fact, one Werner Schroer, aka Black 8. Caldwell is outnumbered, he's got no backup, he's in the middle of a crossfire, and he's against an enemy ace. I can only imagine what the battle looked like, but it surely would have been a spectacle. Caldwell gets wounded in the cockpit. He's taken hits to his back, his left shoulder, and his leg. His tomahawk is shot more than 100 times with machine gun rounds and takes five 20 millimeter hits. But not only is he not shot down, this Australian isn't even out of the fight. Somehow he turns the tables on the Nazis. Caldwell shoots down the wingman and damages Blackgate himself, forcing him to retreat. Yeah, Caldwell and his tomahawk won and live to fight another day. Next on Caldwell's to-do list was to score ace in a day. Oh, did I forget to mention that earlier? Yeah, you thought he was just some pilot, didn't you? Turns out this guy is kind of a big deal. Getting ace is already hard enough, but there are more individuals who have been to space than have scored ace in a day. On the day in question, Caldwell received a radio call that warned of a large enemy formation approaching. It was Ju-87 Stuka dive bombers with fighter escort. A different squadron engaged the fighters, which left Caldwell's flight free to get close to the Stukas. In only a matter of minutes, Caldwell had shot down five of them, bringing his total to 12 kills. He was now a double ace, as well as scoring ace in a day. He would later be a squadron leader for the RAF number 112 squadron, which happened to be staffed with several Polish aviators at the time. His actions with that squadron would earn him the Polish Cross of Valor. It's pretty cool if you ask me. Unfortunately, Caldwell's fun in the African sun was soon to be over. As 1941 became 42, the Japanese Empire was approaching the shores of Australia, and he was called home to defend his nation, where his P-40 was to be replaced with a Spitfire. As the war went on, he brought his total to 28 and a half kills credited, shooting down one aircraft of every major Axis power, as well as having six probable kills and 15 enemies damaged, being a Spitfire ace and having scored 22 kills with the P-40, he was a quintuple ace in total. Caldwell spoke very highly of his platform, saying the P-40 had almost no vices and that it could take tremendous punishment from both aerobatics and enemy action alike. Caldwell would later be involved with a mutiny that was to protest the missions the RAAF was assigning its pilots, which they saw as both dangerous and useless to Australia's war effort. Though he was forgiven for that, he was earlier found to be trading liquor with U.S. forces and was court-martialed and demoted. His service ended with his resignation. All in all, I'd say this guy was a real true blue Aussie through and through. No worries. Before I fully leave the story of Mr. Caldwell, I want to go back for a second. Remember how I said he was in command of number 112 squadron for a while? Well, so far I've not mentioned something very important to the P-40's history. The thing that truly made it iconic. 
Come on, you already know what it is. You've been dying for me to say it. It's that shark's mouth on the nose. Everyone has seen this design before. I don't care if you've never heard of the P-40. I don't care if you've never cared about aviation history. I know you've seen that shark mouth on something before. The shark mouth is iconic, timeless even. But nothing has worn the jaws and eyes with such beauty like the P-40 did. Now, it's a common misconception that the squadron known as the Flying Tigers invented this paint scheme, but actually it was the RAF number 112 squadron to first put the shark mouth on the P-40, which itself was copying the Luftwaffe design. But the story of the Flying Tigers is not to be overshadowed by anyone. The Flying Tigers, also known as the First American Volunteer Group, were basically American mercenaries who were officially considered members of the Chinese Air Force. The ultimate goal of establishing this unit was to defend the Burma Road and the port city of Rangoon, critical supply lines for keeping China in the difficult fight against Japan. While training in Burma, the pilots came across an Indian newspaper which featured a colored photo of British P-40s with shark mouths painted on the nose. The AVG saw the paint job and they instantly fell in love with the design. And within days, every tomahawk in the group was painted with the shark mouth. Later, when it came time to fly their first combat mission, intercepting a flight of 10 Japanese bombers, the pilots fought with such ferocity, they forced the bombers to drop their bombs, retreat, and only one bomber actually managed to return to base safely. A Chinese paper would report that the AVG was fighting like tigers, flying tigers. And so the name, like the paint job, was adopted. So the flying tigers had a cool paint job. So what? What did they do that no one else did? How about a kill ratio of 21 to 1, with 296 aircraft destroyed to only 14 pilots lost? Yeah, they were kind of intense like that. Probably the primary reason for the incredible combat performance of the Flying Tigers was the genius leadership by Claire L. Chennault. See, he had actually retired from U.S. forces in about 1937, four years before the P-40s the AVG would use were even purchased. He had gone overseas to become a military advisor for the Chinese Republic, and eventually a director of the Chinese Air Force. When it came time for the AVG to start making a name for themselves, Chennault decided to take the established understanding of military hierarchy and throw it straight out the window. If two guys showed up to be pilots for the Flying Tigers, one a corporal and the other a colonel, Chennault would probably tear both their insignia off their shoulders and throw them into a river. When you flew with the Flying Tigers, there was no rank. Skill was the only thing that mattered. He also drove home the idea of teamwork, knowing that the Japanese fighters were more maneuverable and numerous than their tomahawks. The AVG was taught to avoid turn fights and instead used fast, slashing attacks, typically in a dive. This kept the pilots in an aggressive position and movement without falling into a situation where they didn't have the advantage. Living on a flying tires base was essentially anarchy. Chennault would basically let his pilots get away with almost anything. They had a habit of getting drunk and riding water buffalo down the streets while shouting Yahoo! They wore cowboy boots in the sky and Hawaiian print shirts in bars, drinking with the local ladies in plain view of British officers who had to dress and act professionally. They killed time by drinking bootleg whiskey, gambling, baseball, basketball, and just straight up fistfights. They also kept a pet leopard. One drunken night, a bunch of flying tigers convinced a C-47 pilot to make an impromptu bombing run over the Japanese-occupied city of Hanoi. Now, if you're smarter than the average bear, you may have remembered that the C-47 is not a bomber aircraft, it's strictly cargo. Well, the flying tigers knew that too, and they found a very, very simple solution. They loaded the aircraft up with abandoned French, Russian, and Chinese bombs, and when they arrived over the city, they just kicked him out the back door, all while drinking booze in between the bombs. When it came time to fly actual combat missions, however, the Flying Tigers were expected to be perfectly disciplined, always respecting the word of the leader, fighting as a group, and remembering to keep the fundamentals of fighting with the P-40 in mind. Now, that didn't stop the pilots from fighting with creativity, though. Due to the situation of their combat service, the Flying Tigers didn't exactly receive vast support from the states, China, the nearby Commonwealth, or really anyone. The original tomahawks they were supplied with sometimes lacked many combat functions like reflector gun sights, cockpit radios, the 30 caliber wing guns, or the bomb hardpoints. 
for that last one, they found a pretty simple solution. They crafted Molotov cocktails out of gasoline and emptied whiskey bottles, and once again, they simply hand-tossed them out of the planes while they were over Japanese positions. By this point, it should be no surprise that the Flying Tigers really like to harass and outsmart the Japanese. One way of doing that was to trick the Japanese intelligence into not realizing how poorly supplied the Flying Tigers were. They would paint their propeller spinners different colors and change their tail numbers every so often. This was subtle enough to make the enemy think they were seeing unique aircraft. At one point, the Japanese radio said they vowed to destroy all 200 aircraft the Flying Tigers had. At the time, they actually only possessed 29 P-40s. Around spring of 1942, things were starting to come down to the wire for the AVG. Although they fought ferociously, they were not equipped for a war of attrition, and Japan, in comparison, was ready to play the long game. Even with British Commonwealth fighter planes assisting on many missions, it just wasn't enough to prevent Japan from expanding further into Burma. To make things more difficult for the Flying Tigers, their contract with China was due to end soon, the 4th of July of that year. The Japanese had pushed up and forced them to relocate air bases twice, the second time leaving Burma entirely. They only had four working tomahawks, and worst of all, the Japanese bombers were hitting especially hard. Luckily, in April, Chennault managed to get his hands on 50 P-40E Kitty Hawks that the RAF had canceled an order for. And you know what they say, one man's trash. And I bet those brand new Kitty Hawks sure must have looked like treasure to those pilots. Although a bit better equipped now, the pressure wouldn't be fully relieved yet. For the third time, the AVG had to change bases as the port city of Rangoon and the Burma Road, which the AVG was originally made to protect, were lost to Imperial occupation. In early May, the Japanese started building a bridge in a gorge of the upper Salween River. Success would mean a route for Japan to drive on the Chinese city of Kunming, the original city the AVG was based at. This would not be allowed. A plan was made to have four Kitty Hawks, armed with abandoned Russian bombs, dive into the mile-deep canyon and strike at the would-be bridge. For five days in a row, the Flying Tigers flew missions into the gorge, dead set on stopping the Japanese ground units. And it worked. The Japanese would never expand further west than the Salween River, and although now an even larger target for Japanese attacks, the Flying Tigers would continue to score many kills, both playing defensively and harassing the airbases of their enemies. And when it came for the 4th of July, it was time for the AVG to disband, and they did have one last mission that saw four Japanese aircraft shot down, with zero Flying Tigers lost. The Mercenary Dream Team was reformed from the AVG into a legitimate unit with the U.S. Army Air Force as the 23rd Fighter Group. But that wouldn't stop them from keeping the legend alive. They still called themselves the Flying Tigers and used the letters FT in their tail code numbers for their namesake. Some of the original mercenaries would actually even stick around for a while to train a new batch of Chinese aviators with the American unit. They developed a cult following in, with other aviators in the region. Frequently, when aircraft were meant to team up with or be escorted by the Flying Tigers, they would paint shark medals on their own aircraft to show their support. While writing up a report on how effective he felt the AVG was for the Chinese government, Chanel wrote this, The Flying Tigers were unbeatable pilots in the sky, and they saved countless lives from the threat of Japanese bombs, even when supplies were desperate. He also apologized for going over his original anticipated budget, to which he received this reply. The AVG was the soundest investment China ever made. I am ashamed that you should even consider the cost. Finally, I'd like to say, about a month after the script was about complete, the last surviving flying tiger passed away. It's hard to be a person like me who is so interested in historical aviation, being the right age to hear their stories, at the same time, they're almost all aged away. But it does make me happy to think that they're all together again. I don't know where men like that go when they die, but I'm sure wherever they are, they're causing one serious ruckus for their host. To them, I say rest peacefully, but something tells me spirits like theirs will always have energy for some other crazy thing to keep them occupied. From start to finish, the Flying Tigers were on their back foot, fighting a defensive war lacking state-of-the-art hardware, short-staffed, and their home was halfway around the world. But when you think about it, that's what the P-40 was an icon for. 
In early World War II, the Allies were on the defensive, many having entirely lost their home country. Their weapons needed serious upgrades, servicemen and production lines alike needed serious combat experience to develop proper doctrines and techniques. And the Allies often found themselves fighting very far from home. And for every one of those weary Allies, the P-40 was there for them. Whenever the going got tough, the P-40 was ready, saying, yes I can. It wasn't faster than a 109 or more agile than an Oscar, but when the Axis powers sucker punched the world, the P-40 was the countering left hook that said, someone ought to teach you some manners. The legacy of the P-40 is the fact that it's everyone's hero. When you think of the P-40, whether you think of communist Russia accepting help from capitalist America, or British dropping bombs on Nazi tanks in Egypt, or brave aviators taking off on a bloody Sunday morning to defend Pearl Harbor, or shark-mouth mercenaries flying through Burmese canyons, or the original aircraft of the Tuskegee Airmen teaching bigots a lesson over southern Europe, the P-40 is in character for all of these roles. It was an aircraft perfect for fighting the good fight. When duty called, it was ready. It pulled more than its fair share of the weight, and when better, more glamorous aircraft came to replace it and win the war, the P-40 quietly sat back, its shark-mouth grinning, satisfied with what it had accomplished. All right, that's a wrap. I really hope you enjoyed everything we made here in this video. This probably went on a lot longer than a typical video will be in the future, having both stories about Clive Caldwell and the Flying Tigers. If you truly did like the video, it would mean a ton to me personally if you could take a moment to support the video in some way, be it a like, a subscription, or a comment. Especially that last one. It'll help me a lot making more videos going forward if I know what my audience likes in the future and what they want to see more of. It would also help to know how many of you are aviation enthusiasts out there. Like, when I say something like double ace or split s, do you guys know what I'm talking about? I really want this channel to be a place for everyone to enjoy aviation, whether you're just curious and happened upon this video, or if you're a fighter pilot in the real world. I also want to reiterate, if you find yourself in the Chicago area and or want to see this P-40 and several other historical military aircraft, come visit the Air Classics Museum. In case you missed it earlier, I've got their website on screen now, and there's a link in the description as well. I should also probably mention that you should definitely not climb on the exhibits like I am. This is something extremely gracious the museum is letting me do. Show them some respect and keep that in mind if you visit. Seriously, just stay behind the dividing lines. That's what they're there for. What you should totally do, though, is visit the museum and show your support. Anyway, this outro thing probably won't be standard. This is just a one-time thing for the first video as I gauge how things are going. That's all I gotta say for now, but I wanna double back one more time and say thank you again. Thank you, the viewer, for watching and supporting this video.